Today we're going to talk about making viral DNA. We've talked about RNA, genome replication, and mRNA synthesis. We've talked about transcription. And today is our last uh, discussion of nucleic acid biosynthesis. And this is for DNA viruses who have to replicate their genomes. Of course, in order to make more viruses, the genome that comes in the cell has to be copied, the same as for RNA viruses. And that's what we'll talk about today. Here's our Baltimore scheme. And the viruses in red are the ones we're going to talk about. Uh, these are viruses with single gap double-stranded DNA or double-stranded DNA for their genome. So we have the parvoviruses, single-stranded DNA. We'll talk about how that's replicated. Uh, the hepatitis B virus, we will just talk about indirectly how the genome gets copied. We will talk about uh, in another lecture on reverse transcription. Although you can, you'll see today when, when the hep, to, hep B genome is repaired to be a fully double-stranded DNA, it's circular, and it's going to replicate very much like the genome of polyoma and papillomaviruses, which we'll talk about in great detail today. So adenovirus, herpes simplex, polyoma, and papillomas, double-stranded DNA genomes. Uh, now, remember that the retroviruses ultimately convert their plus-strand plus RNA genome into a double-stranded DNA, which gets integrated into the cell. And while it's there, it duplicates along with the cell. So the way that DNA replicates in the cell, which we will talk a little bit about today, is how retroviruses replicate their genomes. I'm not going to talk too much about that. In a separate lecture, we'll talk about reverse transcription, which is quite an interesting process in itself. So DNA replication has universal rules, just like RNA synthesis. Uh, in this case, all DNA replication that we know of is primer dependent. So at the top is our template strand in black from three to five prime. There is a red primer hybridizing to it. So all DNA synthesis that we're going to talk about is primer dependent. Uh, the enzyme DNA dependent DNA polymerase adds bases to the three prime end of the primer and synthesizes, of course, in a five to three prime direction. So DNA is made by template directed incorporation. Again, the template is used to specify the next base. DNA is always made in a five to three prime replication. And the, the synthesis we're going to talk about today is semi conservative. That means a double-stranded DNA is separated and both strands get copied to a daughter strand. That's what semi-conservative means. Now, there are places on DNA templates called, called origins. Origins of replication, we'll, re, we'll abbreviate them as ORI, O-R-I. And that's simply where DNA synthesis begins. Now, it's, a, it's an interesting structure we'll talk about today. But in its simplest definition, an origin is where DNA replication begins. And some viruses have one origin, some have a couple. Our genome has thousands of origins because we have lots of sequence, and if we had only one origin, well, it wouldn't work because you'd need at least one per chromosome, right? But we have lots and lots, otherwise it takes forever to duplicate your genome. So DNA-dependent DNA polymerase is the enzyme, as you'll see in a moment, that makes DNA. It needs other proteins. It doesn't work by itself, very much like RNA synthesis. And as I said, DNA synthesis is always primer-dependent. Now, of course, we know the structure of uh, a number of DNA-dependent DNA polymerases. The red molecule on this slide is the structure of such an enzyme. On the bottom is the structure of RNA-dependent RNA polymerase from poliovirus. Remember, it looks like a right hand with finger and thumb domains and a palm that contains the active domain uh, illustrated in the RNA polymerase by red and yellow and green uh, areas. On top, the red molecules are DNA polymerase. Again, it has a palm domain in the middle. Uh, and uh, the, the template uh, uh, product flows across uh, the palm domain, much as we talked about for RNA polymerases. Now, you may notice here that the top of this DNA polymerase is open. So that's one difference with the RNA polymerase. The RNA polymerases are encircled. The, the palm, the active site, is encircled. For the DNA polymerase, it's open. DNA polymerases polymerize DNA by a two-metal mechanism of catalysis. Just, in fact, that's where the two-metal mechanism was first proposed for DNA polymerases. And we talked about it for RNA synthesis first. But in fact, the figure I used is based on DNA, as shown at the right here. We have our template strand. And we have uh, some bases being added 
uh, and the T that's being added here illustrates the two metal mechanism of catalysis, uh, where two magnesiums catalyze uh, the disruption of the phosphodiester bond, uh, and those two magnesiums are held in place by two aspartates, uh, aspartate A and aspartate C, and they're essential for catalysis. So they remove all but one phosphate, and the liberated energy uh, allows for the construction of a phosphodiester bond between two bases with one phosphate in the middle. Very similar to RNA. Uh, why does a virus require a host for DNA synthesis? Because no virus can do DNA synthesis on its own. It's one of those facts that you should remember. It's important. No virus that we know of can do it all on its own. It needs at least one protein from the host cell. So at viral DNA always synthesis always requires synthesis of at least one viral protein. The minimal uh, viral protein is one for the bigger viruses. Uh, some, uh, some viruses require more. And that's why, as we said last time, DNA synthesis is always delayed after infection because it, the viruses have to make at least one protein. And for the simplest virus that we'll talk of today, SV40, a polyomavirus, you'll see just one protein is needed to orchestrate DNA synthesis. The rest comes from the host. And that's what we've got here. Simple viruses require mo more host proteins. They don't have room to encode a polymerase and all the accessory proteins. But bigger viruses encode many proteins, the polymerase, accessory proteins. We'll talk a little bit about that. But they all need at least one. As far as we know, and this could change in next year or in 10 years or in 20 years, as far as we know today, all DNA viruses that we know of require at least one cellular protein in order to carry out uh, DNA replication. And that includes the pox viruses, which replicate in the cytoplasm. So you would think they ha would have everything they need because they're independent of the nuclear bureaucracy, as, as I like to say. But they, they still need a, at least one protein from the host. Very interesting. Now, the, the, an interesting question is where the DNA polymerase comes from. Remember, for almost all RNA viruses, it's an RNA-dependent RNA polymerase encoded by the viral genome, the exception of retroviruses, which have a reverse transcriptase, but it's also encoded by the viral genome. Small DNA viruses, as I've said, they do not encode an entire replication system, but rather they are replicated by the host, but they have to get a way to attract the host to them. So we just think of a, a single viral DNA gets into the nucleus. What are the chances it's going to be replicated? Pretty low. I mean, the nucleus is full of our DNA or cellular host DNA. So the virus has to have some way of attracting the DNA synthetic apparatus of the host to replicate its genome. And that's why these viruses make a protein, at least one protein, uh, that's needed for DNA replication. We'll see how that works in a minute. So the papillomaviruses, polyomaviruses, the parvoviruses, they, they all make very early on, as we saw last time, a single mRNA encoding a single protein which is needed to start viral DNA synthesis. And in fact, it attracts the DNA synthetic apparatus of the host cell to their genomes. Larger DNA viruses, uh, as you'll see, encode most of their own DNA replication systems, the herpes viruses, the adenoviruses, the pox viruses. They encode DNA polymerases and accessory proteins. But again, they don't encode at all. They all need at least one protein from the host cell. And what are these viral proteins that are encoded in the genome and which participate in DNA synthesis? Well, of course, for the bigger virus, there's a DNA polymerase and other proteins that are needed for its activity. We call them accessory proteins. I don't go through all of them with you here. It's not important. It, I'm trying to give you an overview of virology. Uh, but some of the other proteins that you would need is an origin binding protein. Uh, as you'll see, that's one of the ways that viruses attract the cellular synthetic apparatus to their genome. Helicases to separate the two strands so they can be copied. Exonucleases, which are needed to correct errors. DNA polymerases are, are, are different from RNA polymerases because, well, both polymerases make mistakes. In fact, if they didn't, uh, we probably wouldn't be here because evolution depends on mutation, and mutation is caused by mistakes made by polymerases. DNA polymerases have exonucleases that can correct the mistakes, so they have a lower mutation frequency. RNA viruses don't have any such correction mechanism, make a lot of mistakes. We'll talk about that later. 
And then, of course, you need enzymes of nucleic acid metabolism, things like thymidine kinase and ribonucleotide reductase, DUTPases, enzymes that make the NTPs and the DNTPs that you need for DNA synthesis. So those are just some of the viral proteins made by some of the bigger viruses. The little ones don't encode uh, any of these except the origin uh, binding proteins. So our first question, which statement about viral DNA synthesis is not correct? Large DNA viruses encode many proteins involved in DNA synthesis. Small DNA viruses encode at least one protein involved in DNA synthesis. Uh, viral DNA replication is always delayed after infection because it requires the synthesis of at least one viral protein. And some viruses encode all proteins needed for DNA replication. All right, the answer here, of course, is D. Some viruses encode all proteins needed for DNA replication. That's not correct. Right? I think I said that about 10 times already today. So no virus that we know of encodes all the proteins needed for viral DNA replication. There's at least one that has to come from the cell. Um, all the other things are correct, but D is not. Now I want you to remember that. This, when I, these quizzes typically uh, ask you about things that I think are the take home messages. One of the things that we're going to address today is how uh, viral DNA genomes with very different structures are replicated. It's not just the double stranded linear DNA like we have in our cells, but viruses have all different configurations as you've already come to learn. So we have single stranded templates, uh, we have double stranded circles, we have double stranded linear molecules, and the pox viruses, we have a double stranded linear molecule with the ends attached. So you may think, how is it possible for any one mechanism to address all of these? Well, it's, it's a similar mechanism, but there's some twists that make possible the differences, and we'll talk about that uh, today. Now you see on these slides, uh, viral origin binding protein, the red uh, oval there. And so wherever this is binding, it shows where the origin of replication is for these genomes, for the parvovirus single-stranded DNA, it's at one end from the, for the double-stranded um, circular molecules, it's at the origin of replication in the middle. Of course, it's a random, it's a place relative to somewhere else. Uh, for herpes virus, it's, it's uh, in the middle of the genome and uh, so forth. So we'll talk about how those work today. Now, despite having these diverse uh, genome structures, we can look at principles, we can learn about principles of replication. And one of them is that there are basically two mechanisms of double-stranded DNA synthesis. In other words, start with the double-stranded genome and make c copies of each strand. There's two ways that we can do that uh, that happen among cells and viruses. There is replication fork and strand displacement. All right. Now, on the left, replication fork is what our uh, chromosomes are, are the, the way our chromosomes are replicated by our polymerases, and also by papilloma polyomaviruses, herpes viruses, and retroviral proviruses. Those are integrated into the chromosomal DNA, so they're replicated by the same mechanism that our chromosomes are replicated by, and that's replication fork. The replication fork, what happens is the double-stranded DNA is separated by the replication proteins, not the whole thing at once, but just a little area at the origin initially, and then it melts. Uh, and then you have DNA synthesis at both strands, since you get what looks like a fork, and that's why it was called a replication fork, because people saw this in electron micrographs many years ago. The synthesis on both strands is different. On the two strands is different, as we'll see in a moment. On one strand, it's continuous, five to three prime, and on the other strand, it also has to go five to three prime but it can't be continuous because it's got to go in the opposite direction because that's the way the strands are oriented. So you have discontinuous replication. And as I said earlier, all DNA synthesis requires a primer. The primer for the replication fork is RNA. And this slide is shown as a green stretch of nucleic acid. And uh, that's shown as a primer for both continuous and discontinuous synthesis. Okay, now here, the uh, second strand of DNA being made is red. So it's a little violation of our, of our um, scheme of colors, but uh, that's the way it is, so don't get confused. All right, the other mechanism is strand displacement, which is shown on the right. It's done by 
a number of viruses, but not by our cellular DNA. What happens here is the double-stranded genome is denatured at one end by a primer polymerase complex, uh, and, or sometimes, uh, and the primer can be a protein or a DNA, as you will see. Uh, and then that serves as a primer for DNA synthesis. The synthesis displaces the other strand. So you end up with a double-stranded product, one daughter strand in the template, and then the other strand is copied by the same mechanism separately. So displacement simply means that you displace one strand as one is being copied. And uh, this is never RNA primed. Never RNA primed. It's either primed with a protein for adenoviruses or a DNA hairpin in the case of parvoviruses and poxviruses. So this displacement is unique to viruses as far as we know. Um, but uh, they have, uh, this mechanism has evolved probably to solve uh, certain problems in genome replication, as you'll see. Okay, replication for strand displacement. Again, as far as we know, all of the DNA viruses that are out there replicate their genome in one of these two ways. Replication fork is the way we do it, and as far as we know, all other life on Earth. Now, when you replicate a linear double-stranded DNA, you end up with a problem called the end problem, five prime end problem. It's illustrated here. We have a DNA template in blue, and we are making, we're going to copy it. We're going to make a double-stranded DNA out of it, and we have to prime DNA synthesis with RNA primers, and those are shown in green, and they, they're, they're made in a template-dependent manner by a polymerase in the cell that makes uh, the primers, they are then elongated. And on the second line is the elongation step. The red is we're adding DNA using the RNA as a primer. The DNA gets made up till the next primer and stops, and then that primer synthesizes and so forth. So we have a series of short pieces of DNA which, with an RNA piece attached to them. They're covalently linked because that's the way you prime on a primer. So then you don't want RNA in here, you want DNA. You want pure DNA. So what happens is there are enzymes associated with DNA replication that excise the primers. They fill in the gaps. So the polymerase would come into one of the gaps and use the three prime end of the DNA as a primer and fill in the gap and ligate then that last phosphodiester bond. And you get what's on the bottom here. But you can see there's a problem. The five prime end, there's no primer on which to extend the gap and fill it in. So you have a gap at the end. That's the five prime end problem. And viruses have solved this, as I will show you today. Now, we have solved it in a different way. We have something at the ends of our chromosomes called telomeres, right, which are assemblies that replicate themselves as a reverse transcriptase, actually, encoded it as part of the enzyme that does, uh, copies telomeres. And if we didn't have telomeres, our, every time our chromosomes replicated, the ends would get shorter and shorter because of this 5 prime end problem. <coughs> And uh, we have telomeres that extend the ends so they stay the right length. But as you get old, the telomerases lose activity, and the ends of your DNA get shorter and shorter. And so getting old is associated with uh, shortened DNAs. Now, if you add telomeres in, in culture, cells will eventually die because the ends of the chromosomes get too long. But if you add a telomerase to those cells, you can make them live forever. That's one way to immortalize cells, is to add a telomerase gene to them, which will keep cranking out the ends and make them long, and they live forever. So our cells have solved the end problem with telomerase, but viruses do it differently. They don't have telomerases. So let's start with talking about SV40 replication. Way back when, in the 60s and beyond, people could not study DNA replication in cells. They had no way to purify cellular DNA and all the proteins, but viruses come prepackaged. You make a little SV40, you purify it, and you've got an 8KB circular double strand or 5KB circular double stranded genome of DNA. So people would purify SV40 DNA and make extracts of cells and get this to replicate. So we learned a lot about DNA replication from SV40. That's why I call this slide Lessons from SV40. And the first thing we found out was that there's a single DNA replication begins at an origin. And in SV40, there's one. How do we know there's one? Well, when people replicated this genome in, in in vitro extracts, that they could then look at the products by electron microscopy. And that's shown at the top here. And they saw that a little bubble formed on the DNA. And there was only one. Here, the DNA has been linearized with a restriction enzyme. So it's linear. 
not circular. And they could see a little bubble formed, and then it got bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger until it reached the ends. So that's a single origin of replication. Not only is there a single origin, but in SV40, replication goes in both directions. It starts at the origin and goes both, it doesn't go one way only or the other way, it goes in both directions. So it's a bi-directional replication fork. So that's shown on the left. You have our origin of replication. It's a bi-directional fork, so initiation of synthesis goes in you know, both directions. And that's uh, what the bubble is that gets bigger and bigger. And that is the uh, so-called replication fork. It's actually enclosed because uh, it's going in both directions. So we learned a lot about this and many, many other things from SV40. We learned about the enzymes and the cofactors that were needed for replication as well. So let's take SV40 a little further. Let's look at this uh, replication bubble or replication fork in a little bit of detail. So here we have the origin of replication, and we've already replicated a bit in both directions from the origin. And as I said, replication is bidirectional from the origin. Well, that means it goes in both directions. Okay, very simple. And here we see uh, what are called leading and lagging strands. The leading strands can be made continuously by the polymerase because the little RNA primer in green is put down and then the polymerase uses it as a primer to synthesize in the five to three prime direction, which in this uh, part of the bubble is straightforward. The polymerase just chugs along and as this leading strand gets bigger, the bubble enlarges and so forth. On the other strand, unfortunately, it has to go in the opposite direction. Five to three prime still, but it cannot go in from from uh, right to left here, it has to go from left to right. So it makes little pieces. As the bubble gets bigger, it adds pieces. It starts with a primer, an RNA primer, and makes a lagging strand. And then as the bubble gets bigger, made by leading strand replication, it puts another primer down, extends that, and so forth. So as this bubble gets bigger and bigger, there are many, many little pieces of DNA with RNA primers on them going in the wrong direction. Eventually, they're all uh, filled in. The RNA is excised, the DNAs are ligated, and because this is a circle, there's no five prime end problem because there is no five prime end, right? The circle, here's at the bottom is the summary of the five prime end problem. If you have a linear DNA, when you take off that five prime piece of RNA, you're gonna have gaps. But because this is a circle, think of it, if you get to that last piece of RNA, take it out, there's gonna be a piece of DNA with the three prime end there that can be used to fill in the gap. So a circle solves the five prime end problem. It's brilliant, right? Viruses are brilliant. Cells didn't invent anything. Viruses invented everything. So this illustrates a few things. It's semi-discontinuous DNA synthesis because you have a leading and lagging strand. The leading strand is continuous. The lagging strand is discontinuous. So the whole thing together is called semi-discontinuous. It's bi-directional and you get rid of the, um, the end problem, the five prime end problem by having a circular DNA template. So this may be why many viral genomes are circular, to get rid of that problem. Now let's look at how uh, SV40 DNA replicates in some detail. There are a lot of details on this slide, but I will just tell you about the ones that I think are important. So at the top is our a part of our SV40 DNA, it's, it's a, a small segment, it's been linearized now, and we're looking at the origin of replication in the middle there. It's called a minimal origin because you can take a very short sequence and that's enough actually to attract DNA polymerase. What happens, remember, when this virus infects the cell, uh, the first thing that happens is that early mRNA is made, which encodes T antigen, large T antigen or LT. And that is essential, that protein made in the cytoplasm, comes back in the nucleus, and when there's enough of it, DNA replication starts. Here's LT, these uh, orange rectangles. What these do is they bind to the origin. The large T proteins bind to the origin. It has a, a specific recognition sequence that it knows to bind, and it binds in hexamers. There's six of them on each side of the origin. And this binding and subsequent events requires energy. That's what the ATP there is for. The binding of large T melts the origin. It separates the two strands. And then a cellular protein called RPA, replication protein A, comes in and can start binding to the origin and further denature it. Okay, so, so a T antigen uh, allows RPA to bind. RPA would not know to come here 
unless it were for T antigen. And that's why T antigen is so critical for SV40 uh, DNA replication, because it attracts the cellular apparatus to it, starting with RPA. Otherwise, this one DNA in a C of the nucleus would never, ever be recognized, not in time to be replicated efficiently. So again, T antigen binds, it starts to denature the origin. It allows RPA to come in because RPA binds LT. T antigen also has helicase activity. It helps to unwind the origin uh, further. And this is an energy dependent uh, uh, reaction. Uh, there's also a topoisomerase one from the cell that comes in and will bind to RPA and further help denature the origin. Now, why do you have to denature the origin? As you'll see in the next slide, a series of replication proteins are going to come in and start binding to the denatured strands so that it can be replicated. First step has to be replication. So we have recognition by large T, recruitment of cell proteins that help to uh, re coat the DNA. You can see RPA is binding both single strands. Uh, it's preparing them as a substrate for DNA replication, uh, and then the next step happens. So that is why LT is so important for viral DNA replication. Now, LT is an SV40 protein, but all the little uh, polyomaviruses and papillomaviruses encode some kind of similar protein that kickstarts uh, viral DNA replication. Next step. At the top here, we now have a an origin where the middle has been melted. It's a short sequence, maybe 100 bases or so, by a binding of LT and RP, RPA. Uh, then we have some cellular proteins coming in. Remember, LT is the only viral protein that's going to be involved in DNA replication, but it has an important role. Then we have cell protein called primases. Polymerase alpha primase is going to synthesize the little RNA primers, and then it's going to start making short pieces of DNA, and then we'll need uh, DNTPs and NTPs for that. So now we have synthesis of RNA primers and synthesis of short DNA fragments using the RNA primers. Then more proteins come in. You know, you don't need to know the names of any of these. The only thing you need to know is LT, that it binds the origin and recruits the DNA synthetic apparatus. I want you to appreciate how this happens. So more cellular proteins come in, uh, RFC, PCNA, and more energy. Uh, and these will eventually pull in a new polymerase, polymerase epsilon, that will make longer DNAs from the short fragments. Uh, and there's, there are very interesting mechanisms that happen here. But all of this is, is a cellular machinery. All these proteins now past large T are cellular proteins, enzymes, and accessory factors that are coming in and helping to make large, T, uh, large DNA. And you can see that the DNA from the origin is going in both directions. So far on just one strand, eventually it starts to go on both strands. So here, uh, more, more RFC, PCNA. A new polymerase comes in a bit later called delta. So there are a number of different polymerases that participate in this. You make uh, leading strands now and eventually uh, lagging strands as well. So the leading strands are very easy to make because they're, they're straight five to three prime synthesis. Uh, and then eventually lagging strands get made in the other direction, again, all based on RNA primers. And then finally, as this is happening, the bubble is getting bigger. The replication bubble is enlarging. The RNA primers are removed. The, the, the gaps are filled in. Ligation occurs to seal the uh, three prime and five prime ends. And this is all happening as replication occurring. It's a concurrent process. There are amazing movies of this on YouTube you can find of people who have animated this to show the amazing complex and how the DNA uh, is, is replicated and moves through all of these proteins. But that is basically the process. Eventually, this um, bubble will get big and encompass the whole molecule, so, and you'll finish DNA replication. And let's talk about what happens there. Now, there are two topoisomerases uh, in the cell. They're not virus encoded. Some viruses encode. Some of the bigger viruses may encode them, but not SV40. Topoisomerase 1 and 2. And these deal with the coiling and the, the topology of the double-stranded DNA molecule. At the top here, as you're replicating this covalently closed circular template, as you are unwinding the DNA, the rest of the molecule gets twisted up, as you can see here. It gets overwound. And if you take a model of, of double-stranded DNA, you connect and, and you Pull, pull it apart, if you could get such a thing, you would see that the rest of the molecule gets overwound as this replication bubble gets bigger and bigger. 
And because if you think about it, as you un unwind the helix, that unwinding gets transferred to the rest of the molecule. And at some point, the, the overround region gets too tight, so the polymerase can't move through it. So what happens periodically is uh, topo one or two cleaves one strand of the DNA, and it all unwinds. All the torsion or the tension is gone, uh, and then the polymerase can resume. And as, of course, as it keeps moving, the replication bubble gets bigger. Eventually, it's going to encompass the whole molecule. It gets wound up again. The topo periodically comes in and cleaves just one strand, makes what we call relaxed supercoils. So the solution for tension is topo one. All right. If you're, if you're looking for a solution for tension, it's just topo one. Now, what happens at the end? You have two molecules, man, two daughter molecules. So now you have two double-stranded DNAs. If you think about it, they're intertwined. They're like two circles, but they're, they're joined. They can't separate. There's no way that they can separate unless the DNA is cut. And so topo two comes in and cleaves both strands and that allows them to separate. So they're totally linked because of the way that they're made. They would never separate. Of course, that would be useless if they didn't separate. They couldn't go into different virus particles. So topo do does an important thing. It resol this is called resolving the products of replication. We now have the two uh, daughter strands. Remember, each one of these has a strand from the parental DNA, the dark blue and the light blue DNA, and then it has a copy of each a dark red and a light red copy. So we have two copies separated. Uh, these reactions require energy, as you can see here. So that's strand resolution. So that is SV40 DNA synthesis. A single protein, LT, large T, recruits the cellular apparatus to get uh, the genome uh, replicated. Our next question, the SV40 genome is a circular double-stranded DNA. Which statement about its replication is correct? A, viral T antigen binds and unwinds the origin. B, replication is bidirectional from a single ORI. C, the 5 prime N problem is solved. D, has leading and lagging strand synthesis. E, all of the above. Yeah, the answer is E, as you can see. You all got it right. Good, great job. My life is complete. All right, let's look at a single-stranded DNA genome, the parvoviruses. These are single-stranded, but they have unusual structures at the ends. They have these T structures, which are basically base-paired DNA. So here at the top is a schematic of the genome. It has two open reading frames encoding replication proteins. It's called the REP-ORF open reading frame. And then at the right is the CAPSID open reading frame. It encodes CAPSID proteins. And there are three proteins made by transcription of the RepOrf P5, 19, and 40. The ends have been folded into what are called terminal repeat structures. You can see there's one at each end. And below is the sequence of the terminal repeat. And you can see there's the three prime end, the three prime hydroxyl of the DNA, which corresponds to the uh, part of the blue line at the top near what's, where the origin is written, because that's the origin of replication. That's where rep DNA synthesis will start. You can see uh, this T structure is simply formed by base pairing. But what you can also see that it provides a lovely primer for DNA synthesis, right? That three prime hydroxyl with the primer in front of it, that's the primer for DNA synthesis of this viral genome. Okay, so the primer is built into the sequence of the genome. Now, the key here, of course, is to make sure that this end sequence is propagated to daughter strands. And that's not a simple feat, as you'll see in a moment. We're going to talk about how this is replicated. So these viruses with single-stranded DNA, at least the linear ones, are replicated uh, by these T structures at the ends, terminal repeats, which serve as DNA primers. So here is how the parvovirus DNA replication strategy occurs. Um, at the top is just a schematic of the single strand so that you can see how the base pair is forming. You've already seen this in, this, in the sequence, but we've, we write it A, B, C, A prime, D, so the A and the A prime will base pair, same thing at the other end, uh, and, that, and, and then that, that makes the hairpins here. The three prime end at the hairpin at one end is the origin of replication. It serves as a primer for DNA synthesis. First strand is made, uh, starting at that primer. You can see it in red, 
Uh, and then what happens is a nick is made on the other strand between the A prime and the D sequence. That's done by an endonuclease. That's one of the activities of this Rep7868 protein. When that nick is made, it then exposes a new three prime hydroxyl right at the D sequence. That serves as a primer for DNA synthesis. And the next structure here has a little bit of red on the left end. That's newly synthesized DNA. So now we have a complete copy of both ends of the DNA, including the middle. Remember the middle, the DNA began with A, B, C, A prime, D, A prime, B prime, etc., And we've now uh, copied it on both ends. Because the end sequences are the same, they can form hairpins. And at one end, they do form a hairpin. On the left here, you can see two hairpins forming on both strands. Um, the red one at the bottom there is going to serve as a primer for DNA synthesis. That's happening in step, between step, I guess, step six here. You can see a light pink strand now being synthesized. Uh, this is displacement synthesis. That's the mode of synthesis we talked about earlier. And this is what happens for most of the replication of these genomes, aside from that first step. You have displacement synthesis. The top strand is displaced. You can tell by the colors, blue, red, and then the other strand is filled in to be a double-stranded molecule at the very bottom. It's got a left end of red, then it has pink and uh, blue strands. So that's a completely replicated uh, strand, and that goes back to the beginning. It's exactly like the initial product of filling in the viral genome, and it can go through the whole series of replications again. So initially filling in the other strand, and then displacement synthesis to start replicating the genome. And this happens over and over again, and both strands are made uh, in this way. So this strand at step seven that's displaced here could be packaged into a viral particle. It's a single-stranded DNA. So uh, this is continuous replication. There's no discontinuous replication needed here because there's only one direction of synthesis uh, by displacement. Um, it uses the inverted terminal repeat to prime uh, at the very top, that first step, for example. So it doesn't need polymerase alpha, which is needed for making uh, the RNA primers. It needs uh, polymerase delta, RFC, and PCNA to do this displacement synthesis. And I said the Rep7868 proteins bring the polymerase to it. It encode endonuclease and helicase activity. So it's a replication. No replication fork in this. Uh, it's strand displacement. I think there's a lovely way of arranging the genome. Of course, the ends have to be conserved. They can't change. If there are mutations introduced into the ends, it won't work any longer. It has to be conserved to serve as a primer. All right, so that's, that's a unique problem. End problem solved. Topology of the genome is solved as well. Let's move to double-stranded linear DNA viruses. Here's adenovirus with about a 40 kilobase double-stranded DNA genome. There are origins of replication at both ends. Remember, the origin is simply where DNA synthesis begins. So there's an origin here and here, the left and the right end. Re replication is going to be by strand displacement, which is the same as we saw just now for the parvoviruses. And of course, it's semi-conservative. That's the case for all the examples we're going to look at. So let's take a look at this in some detail. Now, the interesting thing here, it's strand displacement. But the primer, of course, is never RNA for strand displacement. Here, it's a protein. For parvoviruses, it was a DNA primer from the hairpin. Here in adenovirus, the primer is a protein. So two different ways of doing the same thing. The primer starts as um, a complex of the polymerase, the DNA polymerase POL. So Paul is encoded by the viral genome. It's an adenovirus gene product. So to get to it, you have to make early gene expression. And to get to early gene expression, remember, you need to do immediate early gene expression to turn on the promoters for early gene expression. So you have to do a lot of synthesis before you can get DNA synthesis. Polymerase is a viral protein. So is PTP. PTP stands for P-terminal protein. So PTP and polymerase are in a complex. Uh, and that complex takes a CTP and attaches it to, the seri to a serine on the pre-TP molecule. PTP is going to be the primer for DNA replication. So the polymerase links the alpha phosphoryl of DCTCMP to the hydroxyl of the serine when they're together in this complex. Uh, and then the C serves as a primer at the very three prime end of adenovirus DNA. So here in the top is the adenovirus double-stranded genome. 
Replication is going to begin at the left end, at the three prime end. It starts with a C, base pairing with that G, and this whole complex is bound to the three prime end, the polymerase, and the terminal protein uh, with the C on it. Then the polymerase starts to polymerize, copying the template that will be copying the bottom strand, the, the light blue strand there. When the polymerase starts to copy, it dissociates from the terminal protein, which is now covalently linked to the C. And then the, the polymerase is adding additional bases to the C based on the template sequence. So you can see uh, in step two, the polymerase is moving along. It's doing displacement synthesis. It's displacing uh, the dark blue strand, the top strand, if you will. Now, in order to keep that top strand single-stranded, there's a protein also made by the virus called DNA binding protein, which binds to that and coats it and keeps it single-stranded to prevent it from forming duplexes with the opposite polarity DNA, which at some point during replication, there's going to be a lot of that around uh, in the cell. Eventually, the polymerase makes a complete copy of the bottom DNA strand. That's step three. So we have a new red strand, and we have a new, uh, we have the old light blue bottom strand. The new red strand has a new copy of the primer protein on it. The blue strand has a copy that was brought in with the virus particle. That was from replication in the original cell, or the preceding cell. Okay, so that double-stranded DNA can then enter the same loop and get replicated again by protein priming and strand displacement. You can get lots of DNAs made this way. But the other strand is not wasted. This strand is now coated with protein, as you can see here at the bottom right, step four. We have the displaced top strand, all coated with DNA binding protein. The ends uh, are ITRs, very much like parvovirus, inverted terminal repeats. The ends of adenovirus DNA can hybridize and form this double-stranded structure. It's not very long, but it's enough to be recognized by the viral DNA polymerase. This little structure here uh, by step five looks very much like the end of viral DNA that comes into the cell. So the polymerase and the PTP recognize it as a viral origin, and they begin to copy it. So now in step five, you see the polymerase has begun extending on that blue strand. It's pu it'll push off the DNA binding proteins as it does so, and eventually make another double-stranded copy. So you get both strands copied, right? They're separated during displacement synthesis, and eventually a complementary strand is made to both. So it's, of course, semi-conservative replication, displacement, synthesis. And um, that's how you get both strands separated. There's no end problem, if you look at it, because the primer, the protein primer, starts with the first base, so there's no RNA primer needed, the protein primer here, and, and you don't have a gap at either end. Okay? So a great example of uh, replicating both strands with no end problem, and it's a linear DNA genome. Now, if our chromosomes did this, they wouldn't have to worry about telomeres, but the problem with that would be, it would be only one origin per chromosome, at least one at either end of our chromosomes. It would be really, really slow. So we have internal origins, and that's why we have end problems. This is how the adenoid uh, single-stranded uh, binding protein uh, is coding the DNA. It actually, the structure of this protein has been solved, and uh, it looks like a plow. And the idea is as the, the DNA polymerase is making newly synthesized DNA, it's displacing the strand, and then new DNA binding protein molecules come in. And we think they probably help to displace the strand as well, help the polymerase to, to separate those two. Our next question is, how is DNA replication of parvovirus and adenovirus similar? A, they both require protein-linked primers. B, replication occurs by strand displacement. C, DNA synthesis occurs in the cytoplasm. D, a replication fork occurs in both. E, none of the above. How are they similar? The answer is B, replication occurs by strand displacement. They don't uh, both require protein-linked primers. Only adenovirus, remember the parvovirus is a DNA primer. You got cytoplasm wrong. That's correct. They're both nucleus. Uh, and a replication fork 
No, there is no replication fork. These the strand displacement, there's no fork. The fork can only occur when there's an origin and the replication occurs in both directions from the origin. That gives you a fork. Herpes simplex virus, we're getting bigger, bigger DNA genomes, encoding more and more proteins. The adenovirus had its own polymerase and other accessory proteins like DNA binding protein, but the herpes virus encodes even more. Uh, this is, a, as you may remember, an enveloped DNA virus with a capsid, an icosahedral capsid with the DNA in it. And the DNA is double-stranded linear, quite long. It has two origins uh, of replication, two, well, two ORI S's and one ORI L, so three origins of replication. And as you'll see, this DNA, when it gets in the cell, becomes a circular molecule. So that immediately should tell you that's probably how it gets around the end problem. But let's first look at what this, D, this genome encodes. Look at all these proteins involved in DNA replication. It encodes a DNA polymerase, a single-stranded DNA binding protein, an origin binding protein, again, to get the cell apparatus to recognize it, although it's got a lot of its own stuff, it still needs things from the cell. A processivity protein, which means that the polymerase moves steadily and doesn't start and stop and start and stop. And a primase, it's actually got its own enzyme for making RNA primers. So you see, as the genome gets bigger, it encodes more and more of the things that it needs. But it doesn't encode everything. No DNA genome encodes everything it needs for DNA synthesis. So here again is the herpes virus DNA at the top. Again, in the virus particle, it's a linear double-stranded DNA. It has lots of repeats in it, as you might see from terminal repeat left, uh, terminal repeat small, uh, and, and these other regions. There, there are various uh, repeated segments that we don't need to deal with here. Uh, what's important is that when this virus deposits its DNA in the nucleus, remember the capsid comes down to the nucleus, docks on the nuclear pore, the DNA gets in the nucleus, it becomes circularized. There's a cellular ligase with this name, DNA ligase 4 or XRCC4, but it's a cellular ligase that takes the two ends and ligates them together. That means it joins the five and three prime ends and it makes a circle. And then the circle replicates. Not like SV40, a little bit differently, but a circle overcomes the end problem as you'll see. So linear DNA in the capsid, circular in the cell as soon as it infects. Let's see how that happens. So here's our circular genome. It's completely covalently closed. There are no gaps or nicks. So an enzyme comes along and nicks these double-stranded circles. You need to have a free three prime end for DNA replication. And you may ask, well, why bother to ligate the circle together and then nick it? Well. You know, the, the, the viral DNA is being ligated by a cellular ligase, which doesn't know that it should leave a, a three prime end. And so the uh, evolution has just dictated that another enzyme come along uh, and nick this template. So you have a three, three prime hydroxyl, which is a primer uh, for DNA synthesis. So the polymerase complex is attracted to that three prime end. It starts to make a complementary DNA shown by the red. Uh, that pushes off it displaces the other strand, the dark blue strand you can see is coming off here. Uh, and then the red eventually goes around the circle and uh, does what's called uh, rolling circle replication. Because as the DNA gets extended, you see the circle uh, has to move. This blue strand moves out and the, the, the red continues to go around the circle. And it does this over and over, going around the original light blue template, which is not nicked and can keep making very, very long DNA products, in fact. It makes huge lengths of, of uh, DNAs, and eventually, we'll see, as these are packaged into newly synthesized capsids, they get cut at just the precise place to be a whole genome, and that's what we mean by genome length here. So you can see the first genome length piece that's been made. We have the original blue, dark blue DNA that came in the cell, then we have a pink complementary copy. Uh, and then we have uh, newly synthesized DNA in red. Uh, now, here you can see uh, this is continuous DNA synthesis. It's going all in the right direction, uh, and, and it's all RNA primed. So eventually, these RNA primers are removed. Uh, and it's filled in because there are new three prime ends for primers, and then uh, they're ligated. So there's, there's no end problem because you continue to churn out genome length molecules, and they have 
uh, the right sequences at their end because there's always an upstream piece of DNA to fill in what other gap is present from the removal of RNA. So it's different from SV40 because the rolling circle is different kind of replication. It is not bidirectional. It's rolling circle in one direction. And so you don't have to worry about a lagging strand, only a leading strand. The idea of having multiple initiations here is that as the circle is rolling and new um, bits of single-stranded DNA are exposed, then the priming can immediately begin on them. And so they don't have to all be huge. So that's how herpes virus works. And our last virus we talk about now, and we do simply because it's very different from all the others, is the pox virus. Different in a number of ways. First, the genome is very long double-stranded DNA. It's longer than any of the than ones we've talked about today, uh, 250,000 bases long or more. And it's double-stranded, and it's got a terminal loop at each end. But what does that mean? It means that the five prime and the three prime ends are actually covalently joined. In most double-stranded DNAs that we've looked at, there's a free five and a three five prime end at, at each end of the molecule. But here they are covalently linked. So if you denatured this molecule, you would get a single-stranded circle. That's one way to look at it. Also at the ends are inverted terminal repeats. And if you're thinking these have some role in DNA replication, you'd be right. So let's see how this uh, virus replicates. Now, the pox viruses all replicate in the cytoplasm. Other viruses do as well. We don't talk much about them, the giant viruses, the Mimi viruses, and so forth. Uh, these genomes apparently can accommodate having everything you need, a transcription program, a transcription system and a DNA replication system uh, in the cytoplasm. But it's still, these viruses still do need some one, at least one protein from the host. It's not independent of the host. How do we know that? If you take the nucleus out of a cell, which you can do, and try and infect with pox viruses, the DNA will not replicate. So something is still needed that's present in the nucleus that's probably coming out for DNA replication. Now here's an experiment done uh, by a colleague of mine, Rich Condit, who used to work on pox viruses, would show you where the virus replicates in the cell. So on the left, these are pox virus infected cells. It's a single cell in each field. On the left, uh, we've, he has stained this with DAPI, which stains DNA, and it's blue. And you can see the nucleus, but you can also see a lot of blue in the cytoplasm. And if this were an uninfected cell, you wouldn't see that. There's very little DNA in the cytoplasm normally. The next slide is stained for a viral protein using antibodies against the viral protein. It's a DNA binding protein, one of the proteins involved in DNA replication. You can see it's not in the nucleus, and it's in these foci in the cytoplasm, which correspond to uh, the DNA staining foci. And in the right is the merge, where you take the two colors, the blue and the red, you merge them on your computer, and you can see the DNA in the nucleus is just DNA, whereas these areas in the cytoplasm have both DNA binding protein and DNA according to the DAPI strain. So that's one way we, we do experiments. We want to see if multiple proteins are co-localizing. We stain them with different colors and then we merge them. So that shows that these are cytoplasmic factories, they're called, where DNA replication is occurring because there's DNA in them and there is a viral DNA binding protein. What's missing here, of course, is an uninfected cell because you should not believe me when I say the uninfected cell doesn't have blue staining in the cytoplasm. You, if you're reviewing this paper, you should demand that experiment, that controlled experiment, because you never know. How does the genome replicate? So we start at the top here with our double-stranded DNA with the ends covalently linked. Of course, you have to nick this molecule, otherwise you can't get a free three prime end. And so here in step one, we have a nick at the left end here in the terminal repeat. You can see, by the way, the terminal repeat is complementary structures. You know, the Fs, the Es, and the Ds are base pairing. And the, the ABC is the loop at either end. So we have a nick between E and D. That is a three prime end. Uh, the viral polymerase will bind to it and extend it to the very end of the molecule. That's the red product that we're getting there in step two. That now reforms, that forms a terminal structure, a terminal repeat structure on both strands. You can look at the letters and see that. So now we have a blue terminal structure and a red one at the left end. So that's step three. I'm going to jump to the right of the slide here on step four. Uh, we're going to, then that three prime end, the red three prime end, 
is going to serve as a primer for DNA synthesis, the second round of DNA synthesis, and that happens in step five. So that DNA is in red. It goes through DEF. It goes through the whole molecule. It reaches the right terminal loop, copies it. Of course, it's denaturing the DNA as it's doing so. It copies the right terminal loop and goes all the way back, and then reaches the 5 prime N, uh, which in, in step four here is a free 5 prime N just next to the terminal structure, and it stops there. So now you have a double length molecule, which is fully double stranded, and you can see half of it is newly synthesized and half of it is the parental strand, and of course that has to be resolved very much like the SV40 circles have to be resolved that are linked, and there's an enzyme that cuts at the right terminal loop there and resolves the two strands, and these are viral enzymes. All told, there are 15, at least 15 viral proteins involved in viral DNA synthesis, including the DNA polymerase, endonucleases, and other uh, enzymes involved. These are all made in the cytoplasm and then imported into these DNA factories. Uh, pretty much independent of the nucleus, except there's some nuclear function that the virus does need in order to replicate, as I said. So that's R3 are four different examples of different topologies, and they represent different ways to solve problems in genome replication. Now, our last question for today, what makes poxvirus DNA replication different from all of the other viruses we discussed today? Uh, A, the complete replication machinery is encoded by the viral genome. B, DNA synthesis occurs in the nucleus. C, DNA synthesis occurs by strand displacement. D, none of the above. What makes it different from all the other ones? SV40, parvovirus, adenovirus, and herpes virus. So the answer is D, none of the above. None of them are different. Of course, complete replication machinery is, is encoded in any viral genome. In the nucleus, now this pox virus, of course, replicates in the cytoplasm and it occurs by strand displacement. That doesn't make it different because other viruses replicate by strand displacement, of course. What makes it different, which wasn't on the slide, is that it replicates in the cytoplasm, of course. All right, let's go back a bit and look at two issues in DNA replication just to wrap up our discussion, and one of them is origins. I've told you that an origin is something where DNA begins, and I've shown you some pictures of that but what do they really look like? Let's take a deeper look into a viral origin. Uh, and here we have our main genomes. Uh, we've got adenovirus, SV40, parvovirus, and herpes virus genomes. And you know the adenovirus origins are at the ends. They're marked there. There's two. The SV40, there's one origin marked there. Uh, one origin on the parvovirus genome and three on the herpes virus genomes. In general, these are typically AT-rich segments recognized by viral origin recognition proteins. Why do you think they're AT-rich and not GC-rich? Someone has to know this, yes. Two, yeah, so GC is really hard to denature. AT-rich is easy to denature. And why make it tough for the origin binding proteins to denature the origin? Because you have to do that to start replicating, right? And so they're all AT rich and they're recognized by viral proteins. And that recognition for those viruses that have to recruit the cellular machinery, that helps to recruit the DNA synthesis machinery. So the uh, origins are also assembly points for DNA replication machines. You saw that I think pretty nicely with SV40. We looked at that in the most detail. And, and as I said, you can have uh, one to three in the genomes that we have looked at. So let's look at, at these in a little bit more detail. Here are three uh, SV40 herpes and adenovirus. And these are color coded. The DNA is blue, two colors of blue for the two strands. And yellow are sequences in the origin that are bound by origin recognition proteins. And the, the AT-rich sequences are in uh, uh, I don't know what color it is, beige, I guess, right, beige. And then the cool thing, or the interesting thing about origins is that they're often very close to transcriptional initiation regions. And so uh, here for the herpes origin, 
which is defined by these yellow uh, origin binding sequences, you can see their promoters going in, in opposite directions from the origin. Uh, these are two different viral transcripts that initiate. SV40, you can see SP1 binding sites here. There's an enhancer here right near the origin. And that means there are promoters close by. In fact, there's an early and a late promoter that go in opposite directions from the origin. They're very close. Uh, and for adenovirus, there's also uh, transcription protein binding sites, NF1, OCT1, very close to the origin. So the two are often intertwined as a way of regulating both processes. So uh, you can see the AT-rich sequences. You can see binding sites for uh, origin binding proteins of the viruses that recruit the DNA synthesis apparatus, whether it be cellular or viral. And then finally, binding sites for transcriptional regulators. So these are what origins look like, because that's the origin there for SV40. That's what's at the top of the circle that I've always been showing you. Large T binding site, for example, is here. There's a binding site in the middle and a binding site to the right. So they have a common structure uh, among different viruses. And of course, there are proteins encoded in different viral genomes that bind these origins. On the right, I've shown you again the different origins uh, of the different viral genomes. Uh, and we've talked a lot about T, large T antigen, which binds to the uh, origin of these double-stranded circular genomes. Papillomaviruses are very similar they're a separate family from polyomaviruses, which include SV40. Papillomaviruses, including human papillomavirus, they have a similar circular double-stranded DNA genome. They also have an origin binding protein called E1, but it needs a second protein called E2 to bind at the origin and, and carry out DNA synthesis. Uh, the parvovirus, REP6878, binds the ends uh, and, and winds DNA, as I showed you. It also has endonuclease activity. It's involved in terminal resolution. So there is 6878 binding to the parvovirus, uh, single-stranded origin there. Adenovirus preterminal protein uh, binds to the origin at the end, and that recruits the DNA polymerase. So remember, the, the, uh, the polymerase together with the preterminal protein bind to the origin. And finally, the herpes virus protein called UL9 uh, binds to the origin and recruits viral proteins for replication. So this is how they work. Different proteins, but similar functions, binding origins and recruiting uh, the DNA replication apparatus. And sometimes they have different other activities associated with them as well. So here's an example, large T antigen of SV40. As I said the other day, probably the most studied protein in the world. So many people have worked on SV40 T antigen over the years. It's amazing. So here it's 708 amino acids. It's a species-specific DNA binding protein. SV40, simian virus 40, it infects, it infects simians. It doesn't infect mice or hamsters or any kind of other species because it is a species-specific DNA binding protein. It doesn't work to recruit the DNA replication apparatus in other species. Um, and on the protein you, on top here, the different functional regions, uh, you can see the, this part of the protein in, in blue, the origin DNA binding, that is the specific sequence of T antigen that binds the origin, nothing else. And then there are other areas that bind the polymerase. Here's a Paul alpha binding domain, so that's how the T antigen can recruit Paul alpha in. Uh, here's another Paul alpha domain. There's a helicase, remember it unwinds DNA, that's the helicase domain there. And many other things that we don't need to talk about. One more thing, though, that's really important here, RB. RB, retinoblastoma protein binding domain. We'll talk about that in a minute. And of course, there's a nuclear localization signal around uh, just downstream of uh, 124, amino acid 124. That gets the protein back in the nucleus, because that's where all this replication happens. OK, so it's a species-specific DNA binding protein for the reasons I've just told you. And it also is important. For, remember, it regulates transcription as well, uh, which we talked about last time, and it controls the cell cycle. It binds and sequesters cell cycle regulators and makes cells enter S phase. And I want to end with a discussion of that. This is so important. Uh, what am I talking about? Well, uh, most of your cells in your body actually are not dividing. You probably know that neurons don't divide, but most of your others aren't dividing either. They don't have to. I mean, if you, if you need division, they will divide, and so there are signals to stimulate that. 
So if you're working out, uh, your muscles need to get bigger, so your cells there will divide. Uh, but there are many other cells in your body that aren't dividing. The respiratory epithelium and the gut tract are exceptions. They're always dividing. Your skin is dividing often and dying and falling off and so forth. But many other cells do not replicate. They do not divide or do so rarely. Okay, that's fact one. It's fact two, viruses do not replicate well in cells that are not dividing. Why? Well, if you think about today what I've told you, most of the viruses need something from the cell that has to do with DNA replication. And a quiet cell does not replicate its DNA, so these DNA synthetic proteins are not being produced. So what's the solution? Viruses have to induce host replication proteins, and they do so by making cells divide. They force the cells into division. And all the viruses we talked about today, maybe with the exception of pox viruses, force the cells to divide in some way, and they usually do so by an early gene product. Makes sense, right? As soon as the genome gets in, it makes a protein that starts the cells dividing. Otherwise, the virus will never replicate. You're never gonna get into the late phase of DNA replication. And you can guess what these early gene products are. T antigen is one of them. That's why there's a binding site on T antigen for RB. So cell cycle control, we understand really well. By the way, because we understand cell cycle control because we've learned how viruses regulate it. And we know that uh, cells uh, go through mitosis, of course, a very small part of the cycle where they divide into two. But before they can undergo mitosis, shown here in red, it's a 24-hour cycle roughly, they have to go through a growth phase where the cytoplasm increases. They have to replicate their genome. And then when only, only when that's done, when the cell has become bigger and DNA is replicated, can it then go through mitosis. But this is a cycle that's very much controlled because you don't want your cells replicating all the time. And so there are many different checkpoints, and a very important one is right down here, it's shown a restriction point, which is mediated by the RB protein, the retinoblastoma protein, originally discovered in kids who have retinal tumors because they have a deletion of both copies of the gene encoding the protein. What RB does is keep cells from dividing when they don't have to. And if you are unfortunately missing RB, your retinal cells keep dividing, and eventually they become a tumor. The recipe for a tumor, as we'll find out in a couple of weeks, is unchecked cell division. Whenever you have unregulated cell division, mutations ac accumulate at every division cycle, and eventually you get about a dozen mutations that will cause the cell to become a tumor. But that's an, uh, for another discussion. This RB protein is the target of many of these viral immediate early proteins. Because it controls entry into S, if the virus can somehow abrogate retinoblastoma function, they can get the cell to divide. And that's what these viruses do that we've talked about today. In fact, SV40 large T, human papillomavirus uh, E7 protein, the adenovirus E1A protein, all of these proteins, besides doing the other things that we've talked about, DNA synthesis, transcription, they also bind RB and inactivate it. So in this picture, here's RB in orange. And um, the, purple, the purple protein is one of these viral proteins. Large T, the HPV or adeno E1A. Now why is binding R RB work at all? Now, so you have to go back to last time. Remember I told you that um, E2F is a transcription factor that is actually required for transcription of adenovirus early genes. So adenovirus makes an E1A protein that binds RB and allows activation of E2F binding sites. The reason that it works is because RB is normally bound up to E2F, this E2F DP complex. Now here on the right bottom is an E2F promoter in the cell. When RB is present on the E2F DP complex, you have inhibition of promoter activity because an HDAC, as we said last time, is histone deacetylase is, is stimulated and that inhibits transcription. When uh, RB is removed from this E2F complex, which is shown on the top here, you then get activation of the downstream E2 promoter. And that in the cell leads to synthesis of, of cellular genes that are needed for going through the cell cycle. So the presence of RB on these promoters inhibits 
cell division because the, the proteins that are needed for cell divisions aren't made. So viruses come in, they negate RB, RB is popped off of E2F, E2F can bind these promoters, and the cell then goes into cell division. That's how RB is abrogated by these viruses. The, the viruses, the cells start to divide. And the cool thing is that adenovirus also needs E2F transcription factor for its own E early region genes. So it's accomplishing two things at once. E1A is incredibly important. E1A is knocking off RB, gets the cell to divide by removing the repression on these genes that are needed for cell division, and it also activates the viral early promoters. So adenovirus, SV40, uh, HPVs, and a number of other viruses, this is the mechanism by which they get the cells to divide. And only then can the viruses replicate in them, because once a cell divides, it's, it's got its DNA system, uh, replication system activated. Now, the problem, of course, will, in most cases, the virus is going to kill these cells. So they'll never replicate forever. The cells will never divide forever because the virus is going to kill them. These are lytic viruses. But under certain conditions, the viruses do not kill the cells, and the cells live forever, and they keep dividing in a host, and dividing and dividing, and eventually they form a tumor. And that is something we're going to talk about, uh, I think, in about two weeks or so, how these viruses can cause tumors, and how we learned all about how tumor formation works by understanding uh, these kinds of interactions that viruses use to push cells through cell division. <laughs>